morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. I just want to see a show of hands. How many fathers do we have here? We got a lot of fathers here. Awesome. So the next question is, how many new fathers do we have? And by new fathers, I mean maybe someone with a child under five years old. Do we have one? We have a couple here. So with those fathers, congratulations. So I want you to look around all the new fathers. And now I want a show of hands from all the dads that have never made a mistake raising their kids. <laughs> all right, cool. See, so just know that you just do the best job that we can. It's a hard role to be a dad. You know, we have to teach our sons how to be gentlemen and how to be strong. You know, and then you have to have a soft shoulder for your kids to come when, you know, they go through their breakups and stuff like that and school. And it's just, it's a hard balancing act that we have to do. And it's sometimes it's a thankless job. So today, I just want to be, stand up here and thank all the fathers that have shown up today. So just a round of applause for all the dads. So before we get started, I... Uh, do, we do have this new game, this authentic faith game that our creative team came up with, and it is available today. It's a good, clean way to have some fun with your family, and uh, you know, we heard this morning a couple of families from the church did have a little bit of a competitive spirit when they played it, but that's not a bad thing. So it is available, and the proceeds do go to the Next Gen Ministry, which I'm a part of, and it's what we do is we're trying to help teach your kids a path to Jesus and uh, what they actually look like in this world when the world tells them that there's something different. So, you know, if you would like to pick up a pack, they're available at the info desk on the way out, and it's, like I said, it's good, clean fun. So, what we're gonna talk about today is James 1, 19 through 27, which is a little bit of a skip from what we've been doing, and I'll tell you how that seemed to work out for me. Um, at the beginning of summer, way back, actually it was around March or April, when Pastor Jeff said he was gonna be gone for the summer, I was talking to one of the administrative assistants, just in passing, and I said, well, who's gonna cover those dates? And she's like, well, you are. And I said, I am. And she says, no, I'm not kidding. You know, you're gonna do at least one of them. And I said, okay. Well, which one? And they said, well, in late July, we'll have you come up and will do something, and I think it was in chapter two or three, but I really love chapter one, 19 through 27. But I, you know, I can't say anything because that's so far down the road. Well, then I get a call back uh, you know, about a week later, and she says, well, can you change the date that you speak to Father's Day? Because we'd like to have a father up on stage, and you just happen to be one. So I said, sure. You know, I never really say no. I'm kind of a yes guy around here, as people know. But I said, sure, I'd love to do that, but what passages am I going to preach on? He said, well, you're going to do, you know, 12 through 19 on temptation. I said, well, that's, that's good, you know. I can do that, but in my heart, I really still wanted to do this one. And so then I get another call, and the same secretary says, well, the person that's speaking next week would like to speak on something else. So if you want it you can speak on the one that you wanted to do originally. So I thought, man, that's cool how that worked out. And usually, my wife can share, when, and probably anybody that gets up here and speaks, is there's a syndrome that may sound maybe kind of weird, but you'll get it in a minute, and it's pre-message syndrome, or PMS. Us guys up here get it too. It's pre-message and post-message syndrome, where I can stay up for nights at a time and just going over the material. What is it that I need to say? What is it that I need to say? And it's so overwhelming at times. What is it that you're gonna say? But I'll tell you, it was the weirdest thing with this message. When I was told I could do it, I wrote the outline in about four to five minutes and I shipped it off to Pastor Jeff. And I asked him, well, take a look at it. What do you think? And there was some scriptures in there that I had never seen or read before that just became evident to me in while I was preparing this. But I tell you, I did have a hard time with it because after I wrote it and looked at it, I'm like, man, that's, some of the stuff in there is not too friendly that James is saying. And my interpretation of this is also not that warm and welcoming. And so I got afraid, do I actually say this stuff? 
you know, or do I lighten up the message and make it really fun and friendly for people to hear? And I just sat at my desk and I kept hearing, you know, like God saying, just say it the way I wrote it. Just deliver it the way I wrote it. And then I asked my wife, I said, yesterday, I'm like, what do I do? And she's like, just do it. You know, the message says, do it. So, so here we are. So we're just gonna do this. So like I said, you know, yesterday we got a couple oohs and ahs and groans and stuff like that. And, you know, people came up and said, well, you know, we kind of need to hear this once in a while. So here we go. So what I thought of when I thought of maturing faith is that, you know, God wants to put us on a path towards Jesus and towards maturity, not lacking anything. You know, we heard in the beginning with Pastor Jeff that he wants us to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But so, and then there's, if we remember way back to the attitude study, Philippians 1, 6 had said that being confident of this, the one who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion. So there is a completion that he wants us to get to, and there is a journey that he wants to get. And I'm reading a book, it's called The Last Arrow by Erwin McManus, who's a great speaker out of Los Angeles. And he talks about pioneers and settlers in that book. And he's saying that, you know, in the 1800s when people were living on the East Coast and they wanted to come to the West Coast, there was this big movement of pioneers to the West Coast. But a lot of them stopped in Kansas and Missouri and never finished that journey. And they became settlers there. They became comfortable. They felt their journey was over. They had gone as far as they felt they needed to go, and they stopped. But the pioneers, they kept going. And I think, you know, a settler is a pioneer who decided to stop at some time. And or a settler, uh, right, but a pioneer just keeps going. And God wants us to be pioneers and finish the journey that he has set out for us. But in our comfort, a lot of times we stop. And we say, you know, I like the part of being saved and that I have, a, you know, my, my salvation is secure and that's good enough. I don't like the extra work that uh, is sometimes said that we have to do. But when Hebrews, I was, and this is one of those scriptures I'd never read and I've never seen or heard before, but as soon as I started writing, it was the first one that came up to me when I opened my Bible that day. And it says, anyone who still lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and God permitting we will do so. When I read that, it was like, you know, I thought, well, he wants us to be mature and yes, yeah, this all the elementary teaching about, you know, Jesus coming and saving us, you know, that's all awesome and excellent. But he's saying, let's move past that. Let's move past that into a maturing faith. And so I pray today that God willing, we will do so, just like this says. So when I started to think about it again, uh, you know, when Ashley was up here talking about the, you know, deceiving ourselves, James talks a lot about self-deception. And when reading the Bible, the first time that we hear about deception is back in Genesis, Back in Genesis, when the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done after she ate and they ate from the tree of, of knowledge? And she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. You know, that was in the very beginning. The devil's job was to deceive us. And in the very end of the Bible, to close it out, it, it's reiterated again in Revelations 12, 9. It says, the great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. The devil's job was to deceive us about our relationship with God. That's what he did to that first woman was said, are you sure that was what God meant that you would really die? I think God was just worried that if you ate from that tree of knowledge that you would be as knowledgeable as God. They were deceiving us, he was deceiving us about our relationship with the Father. James is saying, don't be so quick to think that you're not doing that to yourself. You're doing the devil's work. You're deceiving yourself about your relationship with God at times. 
And then he gives us some actions and some things to look at to see if we are deceiving ourselves and how is our faith maturing. So the first thing that he does, and, and we will break up the, this section of scripture, is the first thing we need to do is to check our emotions. And what do I mean by that? So if we read verse 19, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Every man should be quick to listen. Oh no, does it say every man? No, because some women will be like, man, you never listen to me. It doesn't say every woman should be quick to listen because I know some men will say, man, my wife, she just doesn't seem to listen to me. Or kids will say, mom and dad don't ever listen to me. Or parents, my kids will never listen to me. Or my boss never listens to me. It doesn't say that. It says everyone should be quick to listen. And we should be slow to speak, slow to become angry. Why? Because our human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know, we're such a, you know, especially now in this time with Facebook and Instagram and we could watch on YouTube. Everybody's quick to give their opinion. Somebody might be giving a thumbs down now or thumbs up. I don't like his shirt. I don't like the way he talks up there. My opinion matters. You know, we have Yelp. You know, if my service wasn't great, I'm gonna give this restaurant such a bad review. Like my opinion counts that much. And, I, and we're quick to give it. You know, thinking that, like I said, that I, I matter so much in this person's life that I should be able to say whatever I say as soon as I wanna say it. And it's also saying that in your anger, nothing righteous ever comes. So if we wanna do a quick review, I wanted to talk about back in the crucial conversations, we talked about the four boxes or our path to action. And in the first box, what it means is we see or we hear something. And then we skip over the second box and then it, uh, the next one we do is after we see or, hear or see, see something, we have a feeling. We get this emotional thing going on here. And then the last box is we react to that emotion. So we saw something, so I could see something such as somebody get up that has to use the restroom and it's gonna cause me to react in a certain way because I'm gonna feel something. But in that second box, the thing that makes me feel something is a story that I continue to tell myself about myself. Now, I may be completely oblivious to why somebody might have stepped out, but my feeling is, man, they didn't care about what I have to say. So then it makes me react like I might just like for a quick second shut down for a minute, you know, and that was my reaction. And a story about that is just the other day. Just the other day, we had been, me and my wife had been cleaning up our backyard. We had neglected it for quite a while. And we decided, you know, in order to make a nice family area, because we've been struggling with getting our family together to spend time together and do anything. So we thought, well, let's really clean up this back area. We have this nice patio area. And we bought a table for the back with some chairs and, you know, barbecue, some plants, hanging lights, a mister. We did all of this stuff to make it really nice. And it was my job to build the table and chairs while my wife was gone at work, because I was off that day. So I did, I built this table and I had it all set up really nice and I was pretty proud of it. And then I went to go take a nap. And then uh, my kids came, or the kids in the house came and they saw the table and stuff. So they went outside there to use it and they put a swimming pool in the front for the baby. And that's what it was for. I mean, it was for the family to spend time there. But when I got up from my nap, it was about 15 minutes before my wife came home from work. And I went and I looked in the backyard again and they had destroyed this area. You know, there was food all over the tables. There was salsa spilled all over the chairs. The barbecue was a mess. The swimming pool was in the front yard with, you know, the baby's swimming diaper on the grass and toys everywhere. And I thought, man, my wife hasn't even seen this yet. And she spent all this money to get this stuff ready ready for us. So I said, I better clean it as fast as I can. So I go in the backyard and I wipe down the table. I throw all the garbage away and I do the best job that I can to make it look like it did before they got there. Well, then my wife comes into the house and I smile at her and she just looks around. She's got this look on her face and she walks up to me and she says, and I quote, there's crap everywhere. Now, 
I didn't really say anything for a second. But from there, we said, we got to go to the grocery store. So I'm not speaking to her all the way to the grocery store. I'm actually kind of mad because I did the best job that I could do to build this area, then to clean it up after people that didn't clean up after themselves. And then she reacted to me in that way. When I said, hello, there's crap everywhere. So I'm really mad at her and we get to the store and I'm ignoring her quite a bit and we walk into the store and she says to me, she says, what's wrong with you? I feel like, you know, you're, you're mad and you're attacking me and I'm tell her, you know, I don't like how you reacted to me. And she tried to say, well, it wasn't really for you. It was more about the kids not respecting the area we did. But I still didn't hear that. So she says, I'm going to go out to the car. I don't even want to be in the store with you. I said, well, then go out to the car. I don't care. So she goes out to the car and I push my cart around and then she comes back in and I found out yesterday you know, I thought she came back in because we were good right then. But she told me yesterday after the story, she said, by the way, I only went back in the store because it was hot in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so what? She came back to the store. But the point of the story is, you know, that I, she said something to me. And I thought that her reaction, because of the story I told myself, that I didn't do a good enough job, that I wasn't holding down my responsibility that day, that I had failed in her eyes, and that caused me to feel anger, and I lashed out on, at her about that. And at the end of that day, she said, you know, babe, I thought we were better than this. You know, and it just kind of, and I, I apologized to her yesterday again, and, uh, you know, thought, well, you know, just because I'm up here talking about maturity and faith maturity doesn't mean that I don't have a whole lot to learn myself. So never think that the guy standing up here speaking isn't learning just as much as that he's trying to teach you. So we have to be able to control our emotions in order to have, you know, a maturing type of faith is what he is saying. You know, remember Philippians 1.27 says, whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We have many things that attack us during the day. You know, we have bosses. Luckily, I've got a pretty cool one, but uh, not always. You know, I've got a boss now that still owes me money from a year ago. And when I talk to him, sometimes I want to get really angry with him. But I have to always remember that in all my relationships, you know, we have to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, especially that when we say we're believers in Christ, people are looking at us for our reactions. You know, how do we react to people in crisis? So there's a man named Viktor Frankl, and you might remember this quote back from the Crucial Conversations, but it's still relevant. And it says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in that response lies our growth and our freedom. So the more space we give between that stimulus, because some of us, when we're young and immature, it'll go stimulus response. Like, just like that, just like that. Without even a time to think about what we really saw or what really happened. And what it's saying is that it, as we mature, that space grows. And as that space grows, we're able to really think about what it is that happened and in that, we're able to respond in a better way the longer that we can take to make that response. So the second step of maturity or the signpost, whatever we want to call it, is that the action is we need to choose a side. So the first thing we need to do is control our emotions, and then we need to choose a side, kind of like choosing a team. It says, therefore, we must get rid of all moral filth. And the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. It doesn't say get rid of some moral filth. Because some of us might tell ourselves, you know, well, I don't watch pornography anymore. But I'll watch Bachelor or Teen Moms. Or, you know, I'll, I'll, well, I don't listen to music with cuss lyrics in it so much anymore. But every song on the radio on 104.7 degrades women and stuff like that, that's saying get rid of all of that. You can't walk with God and live in moral filth. 
And I'm not saying that you can't be in the world, but you can't let it overwhelm you and become part of you. So I had this fishing pole here, and I read this quote the other day, and I'm, I'm not a good fisherman. As a matter of fact, I'm a terrible fisherman. I started fishing when I was about 13 years old, and I used to go every week with a friend of mine, and this was back when I was 18, and now I will be 48 years old. So 30 years later, and any time I've gone fishing, I have never even had a bite. So not only have I not caught a fish, I haven't even had a bite, so I am a terrible fisherman. So I'm gonna ask the good fisherman, who, who fishes in here? So we have a few fishermen and women. So I'm gonna ask a question, like if I wanted to catch a tuna, let's say, could I go to Merced Lake? <laughs> you guys laugh, but why couldn't I go to Merced Lake? What's that? They don't live there, right? So there's none in that lake. So if I wanted to catch a catfish, could I go to the ocean? No? Why not? Same reason, right? They don't live there. So what I, I saw this quote, and this is actually a good lesson for young men and women and people that are dating or looking for a partner somewhere. And it says, the pond you fish in determines the fish you catch. So if you're out there dating and you're trying to find somebody in the bar and then you take them home and then you realize they're not a very moral person, where did you find them? What pond did you catch them out of? You know, and it's very much the same in our lives. And you know, God is saying that you, you can't you know, call yourself a moral Christian person and yet be continuing to fish in that immoral pond that's all you're gonna catch. If your life is full of problems, where are you fishing? So you have to choose where you're gonna go, and that's, that's what he's saying. So that, and, and remember, in Mark 3.25, it says, if a house is divided against itself, it cannot stand. So you can't be in two places at once, you can't serve two masters, and again, we can't live and fish in the pond of immorality and expect moral fish to come out of there. The third thing that we have to do is we have to take action and get off the sidelines. Um, uh, you know, a, it says here, do not merely listen to the word and again, so deceive yourself. Again, they're talking about self-deception. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You know, that's, that's a kind of a strange metaphor because a lot of us, we look in the mirror and we want to automatically forget what we look like. That's what our whole goal is. Like, no, I didn't really like what I saw in there. I'd like to forget about that. But what he's saying is, you, you know, there's a man right now that, that is a good example of this. And I... I not passing a judgment on this man, but he's, have you heard about the police officer that's in the Parkland shooting? The one that when, they, when the guy went in and killed all those people at the school, they've arrested the police officer that was on site because, for negligence. You know, and, and he's a good example of what this is saying. He got up in the morning and he put on his uniform, his police uniform, where he swore to serve and protect the community. And he was hired by a school to go in there and protect those children. And the moment the rubber met the road, he didn't do that. And they're, they're saying this man is a coward. That is what they're actually trying him for, is cowardice. And that's exactly what this verse is saying. He forgot what he looked like when he stepped out there. And sometimes we forget what we like, look like. And God sees us as holy and blameless. He sees us as the light of the world. He sees us to be the light in the darkness. And then we go out there, and what do we look like? We forget what we were called to be. We will forget who God created us to be. We forget that when we were saved, we were supposed to go out and share this message. So we don't look like God sees us anymore. And he's saying that you have to get off the sidelines and do something. Do what that word said. Do some action. Sometimes people might wonder why their faith can't move a mountain, and I'm telling you that some people, their faith can't even move their feet, 
let alone move a mountain. You know, and so that's, you know, it's saying that. Don't forget what you look like. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he does give us jobs to do. It's not to sit on our behinds all day long. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, therefore we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So what is an ambassador? An ambassador is somebody that goes in the place of somebody else and represents that person or that country. So I'm thinking like we have an ambassador, the United States ambassador to England. So where is that ambassador at? He's in England. And what is he doing? He's representing our best interests in the United States. So if we are Christ ambassadors, where are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be in the world doing what? Representing Christ. But if he was to look at us or anybody was to look at us, would they recognize that at all? If Christ looked back and said, you are my ambassador, how have you represented me? Do we represent him or do we just sit here and then go about our lives? I seem to think, and this is, again, my opinion, that we've created in our culture and in our church what I thought of as a Mises Christ. Mises Christ. What does that mean? It's a kind of a hybrid between with me and Jesus. And what I thought about that was as long as I can fit Jesus into my time, into my schedule, if he doesn't ask to reach into my wallet, if he doesn't ask me to do something I'm uncomfortable, then we are good. And that's the man I want to follow. And a lot of us have done that. You know, it's hard enough to get here and sit in the chair for an hour, let alone to spend the rest of our time, you know, representing God. But that's not what he wants from us at all. You know, he wants us to fit our lives into his mission. And so many times you'll ask somebody, you know, can you do something or go to help a friend and you're just like, man, I'm just way too busy today. It just doesn't fit into my time. And so I think that is a big part of a maturing faith is, you know, how do you use your time and how do you allow Jesus, you know, you to fit into his plan? You know, he never meant or came or said he was about to fit into yours. And he called us to follow him. And if he was to turn around right now, would you even be behind him close enough where he could see you? I don't know. That's a question to ask yourself. Is you, you have to choose a side, get off the sidelines, do something with your faith. So in order to do that, though, you, this is the next step. In, in the next block of scripture, we have to examine our hearts. Examine your heart. He says that those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves. There's the word deceive again. And this is one of the harshest things that I've read in the Bible about our relationship or our quote unquote religion. He says that if you do not keep a tight rein on your tongue and deceive themselves, their religion is worthless. Worthless. Can you imagine, we've sat in here, some of us have been here for a short time, some have given their whole lives to this following of Jesus. And he's saying, if it doesn't change the words that come out of your mouth, then what you've been doing this whole time is absolutely worthless. And that's pretty harsh. That's coming from the brother of Jesus Christ saying that. And why do I say your heart and just not your tongue? Because Luke 6.45 says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what comes out of your mouth is what is buried in your heart. You know, when you're squeezed and you react really quickly, your first reaction, whether it's good or bad, shows where your heart is at that time. You know, if your heart's in a good place, us guys, we don't have to say sorry so much because we wouldn't say the things that we say that hurt people. Same with wives to husbands. Just where is your heart at? 
And the last thing that you have to do, that your faith must do to show maturity is you have to make a difference. Your faith has to make a difference. He says in verse 27, a religion that our God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, orphans and widows, back in the time of Jesus, when, when somebody lost their parents or their husband, was what they're talking about, the widows, they became very low in society and they no longer had anybody to speak for them or a voice for themselves. And what, the, what James is saying is that a true mature some mature in their faith will stand up and speak for those people or speak to those people. You know, I have a friend who I will not point out who's going through a really hard marriage right now. And maybe a widow is not somebody that lost their, their partner through death, but maybe it's someone whose marriage is dying and is close to being alone. You know, and then those children will be close to being orphaned by somebody. And how do you step in and speak into their lives, or are you too busy? Maybe tomorrow I can do it. I just don't have the time today. We need to make a difference with our lives and with our faith. So in conclusion, I, before I talk about Be the Change for a minute, my grandfather, whenever I went to work for him, even if I owed him money, he would have us do a job, and my grandmother, we'd go and it, whatever the job was, painting cabinets, gardening, whatever, for my grandmother, she would pay us no matter how much work we did, it was a ham sandwich. You know, that's all we would get. You know, we could remodel our entire bathroom, and she'd come up with a ham sandwich, and we knew that's what we were getting. But my grandfather, no matter if we owed him money or if we were in trouble with him for any reason, said that for an honest day's work, you deserve to be rewarded for the work that you do. And so I wondered, what is our benefit if we have a maturing faith? If we do all of these things that we're supposed to do, and we go back and we check our emotions and we learn to control our anger, because in anger we never do anything that is righteous in the eyes of God. Humans are not capable of that. So we check our emotions we become slow to become angry. We choose a side and we determine that we're no longer gonna live in the moral filth or at least allow that to infiltrate our hearts. We get off the sidelines and we do what God wants us to do. And then we examine our heart and we no longer deceive ourselves and we want our religion to be worth something. And then we decide to make a difference in the community and people's lives around us. What is our benefit? Well, he says it in verse 25. He says, whoever looks intently in the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. They will be blessed in what they do. And a bonus verse is, remember, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called to his purpose. There's our benefit that we will be blessed in what we do. And blessings come in different shapes or forms. We're not saying that, and I, you know, my life was a proof that, you know, we're not being blessed financially, you know, in what we do. But, you know, I was sharing with a young boy that came into my office the other day, and I said, you know, you know me and my wife have both kind of changed our professions to follow what we feel God has called us to do. And both of us have taken pretty significant pay cuts and my wife works less hours, less days, but it seems to both of us that we are taken care of so much more now and blessed so much more now with the things around us than we were when we were working just to gain stuff. That God has blessed us for what we decided to do because we are trying to mature in our faith and do these very things. So now, next week, we are going to have a Be the Change event. And I thought that in order to do a Be the Change event, we needed to be mature in our faith and know what it looks like because we can't be the change if we haven't felt a change because we can't give what we don't have. 
So when we go home and, you know, the sermon today was a little bit about self-examination. Where are you in your faith? Is your faith a life-changing faith like it was to Paul? You know, after, you know, he went from pure persecuting Jesus to going in that room. And then it says, after his eyesight was regained, he immediately went and started preaching the gospel. I mean, he did a complete 180. And are our lives doing a complete 180 or did we do a complete one and start to change and then stop because it was a little bit tough? So next week we're gonna do the Be the Change and for just a couple minutes I'm gonna invite somebody that I'm fond of to talk about what she has done and what, where she works does for the community. So if you would welcome our guest. Good morning, YC. My name is Lily, and I am the new Client Services Director for Alpha Pregnancy Help Centers. For those that know me, hi. For those that don't and are looking at me like, where have I seen her? She looks kind of familiar. I don't know if I've seen her before. Let me, allow me to demonstrate. <laughs> Does that look familiar? <laughs> Or, when he's giving hugs, <laughs> or when the hugs are taking longer. <laughs> I'm Ruben's wife. So for, the, for those of you, it's like, oh, that's where I know her. My name is Lily. And to be honest, I love being Ruben's wife. And just seeing him in his element, and I love that his element is God. So, happy Father's Day, honey. <laughs> Enough of his element, now on to mine. My turn. <laughs> I work at Alpha Pregnancy Help Center and I recently started there. I love that job and I think they're a great employer. Just working in ministry is so fulfilling. Um, to be able to sit down with my boss before we start our day, our whole staff, all four of us, <laughs> sit around a little table and we pray for the center, we pray for each other, we pray for the clients that might come in. And it is a beautiful thing. Uh, I never imagined praying with my employees and everyone I work with. Very fulfilling. Um, but I think it's a lot more than that. We provide life-affirming solutions for pregnancy, relationship, and parenting, which means um, we provide free pregnancy tests, free ultrasounds, free parenting classes, um, resource closet. If somebody needs diapers, somebody needs formula, and they're desperately in need, they can come in and pick some up. But I think we do a lot more than that. And we will be here next week at the Be The Change event. We'll have a booth. And I just wanted to have the opportunity to kind of speak on exactly what it is that we do because I never in a million years imagined exactly what it was all going to entail. When I tell you that we pray and we say these beautiful prayers and they're so sweet and I'm so happy to work there and I'm like, you know those kind of prayers where you're like, oh. Yes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. They're beautiful and they feel so good. But in reality, and excuse me, I'm very imaginative and I have a lot of, well, what I picture. <laughs> so what I picture is we're actually like, we are putting on the war paint and we're like in a huddle and we're like, yeah, can you imagine like Braveheart? That's how I feel like every morning is with our morning prayer because we go out there and we're like, yes, let's do this. Because that fight, the things we face there are not lightweight. We are facing women that are considering abortion. We are face to face with the enemy. We have joined the ranks of the resistance and we are right at the front and we're dealing with lies of the enemy constantly. And I never imagined it was so bad right here in Merced. And it is. So the question would be, what could we do as a congregation and just as a people to kind of help? Num out? Number one thing is prayers. All the prayers we can get, 
for the women that will come to talk to us. We do peer counseling. We talk to the girls. We love the girls. We teach them that God loves them. And if we have the opportunity, we minister to them and present them with the gospel. So prayer is crucial. Uh, and other ways, just like the tithing here, finances, we're run strictly based on donations. We are, our peer counselors, our volunteers are us. We, we have to provide for this agency. So uh, finances are a big part of it in our fundraisers. Another thing is volunteers. Anything from peer counseling to actually talking to the girls. I, one of my favorite women to listen to on YouTube is uh, Megan Fate Marshman. And she was talking about how God calls us to obedience, not to results. And I feel that is strictly applies when you're thinking of where am I going to volunteer? What am I going to do? What if I can't do it? And it's not that you can't do it. God will do it. We just have to show up. We just have to be obedient. So when you pray about where should I volunteer, how can I make a difference, you don't have to be able to do it. You just have to show up. And the volunteers do everything from peer counseling to shredding paper. There's a variety there. You know, if you're a nurse or a sonographer and you want to actually do the sonograms to show these girls that that baby is alive, you could do that. There's plenty of opportunities to serve. Thank you. It sounds like a great organization, and just thanks for sharing. So, a couple of things in closing. You know, again, I'd like to wish everybody a happy Father's Day, and I'd like to encourage everybody to look at all the hard work that's been done out there in the, the common area back there with all the nice tables and chairs that have been set up in order for we can hang out and, you know, fellowship a little bit together. Uh, out in the foyer area, there will be some food, uh, some sliders and some root beer for Father's Day. We encourage you to hang out a little bit and uh, just get to know each other. Maybe somebody new that you haven't really had a chance to meet or talk to. We would highly encourage that. Now, before we close in prayer, I'd like everybody that has a smartphone to take out that smartphone. I'll give you a second because I couldn't. I definitely couldn't have enough mirrors. And I want you to put on your front-facing camera and I want you to look at yourself. <laughs> now, you don't have to take the picture and I, and, and I encourage you to lift it up this way so it's not like the chin thing because that looks bad on all of us. <laughs> so just look at yourself for a minute. And God is saying that you are a loved, forgiven and blameless, and you are called to be an ambassador for him, for God himself. And the scripture that we're reading is saying that when you put your phones down and you step back out into the world, not to forget what you just looked at. Never forget that God has equipped you to go out there and be a light to this world, just like all of these agencies that'll be here next week that the, all their mission and our mission here in the church is just to lighten up the dark places, you know, because any amount of light. I did this with the kids. We blacked out the room and just the light of my phone overcame that darkness. And darkness cannot overcome the light. So go out there and don't forget what you look like. So if we could bow our heads and all you fathers, I'm gonna close so you can go enjoy that Father's Day barbecue. So that's, we shortened it just a little bit. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> so let's pray. All right, dear Lord, I just thank you for being our father. I thank you for giving us dads, somebody to look up to, to model our parenting skills by. But in order to do so, we gotta take a look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves. Women too, as mothers and wives, how mature are we? What do we look like well, if we forget what we look like, then what do we look, the other people that look at us see? Are they seeing you, Lord, in us? Or are they still seeing that moral filth that we have inundated ourselves that is coming out of our pores when we immerse ourselves in that? Give us the strength, Lord, to just self-evaluate maybe over this next week and find out where we are. 
in our faith, in our walk? Are we pioneers still, Lord, towards you? Or have we chose to settle in that Mises land? We love you and we honor you, so we hope that that's not where we're stuck, that we will continue on and let you continue your work and complete us, not that we have chosen to say, hey, I'm done. So again, fathers, I honor every single one of you today, you know, for the work that you do, you know, it's, it's so important to be around in our kids' lives and to be a good role model. And Lord, again, you are the perfect example of that. So continue to feed into us as your children because we love you and we honor you. It's in your name that I pray, amen. Thank you. Have a good Father's Day, everybody.